this is this is yeah this this works good uh, good morning everybody i hope you all uh, enjoyed the keynote just now you know I, I noticed a little bit of delay at the start but eventually it seemed to go extremely fast just as you would expect from josh of course but uh, enough about that we're here for uh, tom Coblon right now and he's gonna share a little bit about the way how at i manage today uh, we'll set it up all in scale so uh, give it up for tom Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all for coming in. That's um, that keynote by Allard and Josh is going to be quite tough to follow up. Um, this slightly slower pace. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming. This talk is about um, iManage and a new product we've built called Insight Plus. Um, it's a multi-region application that we hope is robust, and we'll try and cover some of that today. Um, so in terms of the agenda, I'll do a quick introduction on who I am. Um, who are I manage? What's Insight Plus, the product that we're building? Uh, the multi-region aspects. We also might change tack a little bit at the end if there's time to talk about a Kubernetes operator that we built for blue-green deployments, and then try and leave a bit of time for Q and A at the end as well. So, who am I? My name's Tom Claybon. I've been a software engineer for um, close to 15 years. I graduated from Bristol University in the UK um, with a master's in engineering. British Masters, which I think is a little bit easier than the ones you do over here. Um, I did an IBM graduate scheme for two years where I rotated around different departments, um, some down in the south of the UK, some in London. Um, it was interesting, some of it, and tough, some of it, because the last department was a kind of an old acquisition. It wasn't getting much funding anymore, and I wanted to go into a startup, so I went to a jobs fair called Silicon Roundabout. My two conditions of all the kind of meeting all the startups and jobs they had was that they were Java and they were close to the train station. That was it. Um, Raven was one of the top two that came out. I joined them back in 2012. Um, we then got acquired by iManage and here we are today. Um, married for eight years. We have, uh, my wife is a vet. We only have two dogs, which is very surprising. Uh, and we have a three-year-old daughter now as well. Um, outside of dog walking, childcare, work, if I get time, I quite enjoy home automation. I don't know if anyone uses Home Assistant here, but I could talk about that for hours. Um, I also quite enjoy barbecuing or smoking meats and have managed to kind of combine the two with some Bluetooth sensors, feeding different um, temperatures of the barbecue and the meat into Home Assistant, graph it over time, you can take derivatives, second derivatives, figure out how fast it's cooking, whether that's changing, when it might be done link it to Alexa and she tells me when it's going to be ready and my wife gets very annoyed. Um, so enough about me. Um, let's say a few things about who I manage. Has anyone heard of iManage other than me today? And Rafa, because he works with us. No, <laughs> uh, that's not surprising. So iManage um, is probably about 30 years old now. It was founded in 1995. Uh, it's quite old for a software company. It's been through a series of acquisitions, initiated by Interwoven in 2003, Autonomy after that, HP after that. And then after a few years within HP, the management bought themselves back out of HP as an independent company. In the meantime, Raven was founded in 2010. I joined in 2012 as the ninth employee. We were about 50 people when we got acquired by iManage in 2017. Um, I manage we're about 200 then, and today we're about 1,000. So we've had quite a significant period of growth over the last few years. Um, and then literally last month, we launched Insight Plus, our new product. Um, although I say new, it's the cloud version of what we had on-prem. Um, and we are currently onboarding our first customer for that as well. So what do I manage actually do? <laughs> uh, the big Dark, well, not big, they're all the same size. The dark one in the middle uh, called work is the document management system. And that's just like a glorified file system, but you can have different versions of a document over time. Think like Git tags in the repository. Um, and then you can also have extra metadata um, if you want to add what customer the document was for or other properties about it. And also the security is a lot more uh, granular and fine-grained control than what you'd get on a normal file system. Uh, down the bottom, you have lots of tooling around matters. Matters are like legal projects. Um, law firms work with clients. Those clients, they'll do several projects with. Each of those is a matter. 
Um, often security is managed at the matter level. You want people to have access to all the documents contained uh, or pertaining to that matter. Uh, or you can look at, uh, if you're bringing new matters in and you want to estimate them, you can look at past matters and how long they took. And uh, There's all sorts of matter management <coughs> tooling. On the left, there's kind of more integration tooling. Um, Drive is like Box, Dropbox, file sharing. Uh, Tracker is task management. If you start a new project and you have a series of actions you want to do, those actions can belong to the matter and the security applies to those actions and you can assign people to them. And so it's, it's just task management, but built into the ecosystem that these lawyers are using. Uh, and then at the top, you have the old uh, Raven stuff. So Insight, um, there's a kind of funny history. We were building a version of Insight called Connect in Raven and iManage had a product called Insight. Ours was a bit newer and nicer looking, and so when they acquired us, we rebranded that one as Insight on-prem, and now the people that worked on that, some we still support the on-prem one, but a lot of them have moved into building this new cloud version. And iMage AI um, is some actual AI that we've done for a long time. Um, some of it is document classification, where we're training. Uh, we have lawyers who've marked up thousands of legal documents, and we've trained models on those. Um, those labels, those classification labels get fed back as metadata and you can then expose that as facets in search. Um, we also then, if there's certain types of contracts like employment contracts, can pick a lot more information out of the document. So all of their uh, contracts tend to be derived from templates and it's quite easy to find salary, notice period, holiday bonus, all those things you could pick out of an employment contract and you can do the same for uh, other, other types of uh, documents as well. So those are products that we have. Um, most of our customers are Microsoft-based, um, so we use the Azure ecosystem. Um, and everything is available on-prem and in the cloud. Some of it is the same versions, just running in a different environment, and some of it is stuff that we've rebuilt. So who do we sell these things to? There's two types of customers for us. It's, uh, everything's focused at the legal market, but you can either have law firms or you can, some firms when they're bigger will have in-house legal departments. Uh, so for the in-house legal departments, we're in 37% of the Fortune 100 companies and another 1,500 clients on top of that. And in terms of law firms, 80% of the world's biggest law firms use our software and another 2,500 on top of that too. So 4,000 customers. Um, in total across the on-prem and cloud software. And these are just some examples of um, our customers. So it ranges from travel, Air Canada, um, education, uh, manufacturing, Zippo. I have no idea what Zippo do with our stuff, but it's there as well. Um, and then some of the biggest law firms, if you might have heard of Fresh Fields or Pinson Masons, all those other big ones. And I've included a few more European ones um, just out of interest if anyone's heard of any of those. And some stats, how much do they use this stuff? This is just looking at the cloud, cloud versions of our software. Um, it's probably about a thousand of our customers at the moment are in the cloud, so a quarter of them. But that quarter added over 2.3 billion documents in the last six months. And including the UI, they're making 200 million API calls a day. And that's composed of 10 million text searches and also a million document previews. Um, so if you find a search result you're interested in, rather than having to download the Word document and have Word installed, you can just view a web-based um, preview of that document. So that's it, a, a kind of brief overview of Insight. Um, so what is Insight Plus? Uh, I thought before introducing the product, I'd try and describe the problem that it's solving. And I thought I'd give an analogy for everyone who's a, a software developer. So the, my analogy was going to be Spring Maven projects. And if you start a new one of those, hopefully it will take a lot of inspiration from Josh Long. And you don't start from scratch with a Git repo and a POM, and you start writing XML and trying to remember exactly what the tag names are. And you use Spring Initializer. Right? These tools exist to make our lives much easier. And if you don't use Spring Initializer, maybe you've got projects in-house that don't just have your Maven set up, but all of your Git workflows and everything in there too. So you might just copy one of those and delete the bits of code you don't want and use that as a template to get going from. That makes us more productive, more efficient, um, and lawyers want to do exactly the same. But their work is not coding. Their work is writing contracts or um, working with their clients. And they need to have 
uh, kind of templates and things that they can work from and be able to find those quickly and easily. So that's the, the kind of main driver behind Insight. It's not just documents, but matters and people too. If you're starting a new, new project, there'll be existing projects that have um, folder structures and everything they, they need to use. And then there'll be people that are familiar with how the law works for a certain type of industry in a certain um, place in the world. And they're useful to um, be able to find those people quickly and easily. Um, and then, yeah, question them on how to start more efficiently on your new project. Uh, this is some stats, I don't know where they're from, but kind of back up the argument that people do value knowledge work. If you didn't have Spring Initializer or templates to work from, um, it, it would be a much slower process. And people recognize that in every industry. Um, and post-COVID, I think those uh, people believe that's going to get even, even more important. And it kind of makes sense. Everybody's working at home. There's less personal contact but you still need to understand who these people are and what they're working on. And if you can't do that by talking to them, you need other tooling to help with that. Um, so that's the problem that we're solving. We can't do that without some data. Like we're taking all of these things from their past, past practices. So what sort of data are we bringing into the system? Um, there's different kind of entities that we're bringing in. So the, most, um, the, the biggest one for us is the documents. Uh, most of that comes from the document management system. Um, we also take documents from the intranet. If you can provide a connector for your intranet, we can pull the documents from there. Uh, if it's a common one like SharePoint, some of these things come out of the box. And there's also other, multiple other third party places um, like Practical Law Company provide some template contracts um, or guidance for, for lawyers on how they should uh, undertake a certain uh, contract or something. We also pick up matters. Um, there's a lot of metadata about matters. A lot of it, uh, some of it is in the DMS, the name, but a lot of it is in other tools, ma uh, matter management tools, where you have things like the number of hours you build to it or the contract value, uh, the jurisdiction it was in. If it's a court case, things like the judges that presided over it. Um, and also then about people, uh, we can take the author names from the document management system. But we also want to get your bio, your hours that you're building to different projects so we can understand what you're working on, what you might be an expert in. Um, and we bring all of this together. So now we have the data. Um, this is a screenshot of our new version of Insight Plus, which probably to a lot of us just looks like a normal search application. Um, you have a search bar at the top and some results in the middle. Uh, and it's designed to scale theoretically to a billion documents, if not more. Um, we haven't tested up to that range yet. Uh, it doesn't sound that high when you consider the likes of Google and Bing and the size of the internet. Um, but we think we have some quite unique challenges that they don't have. And the biggest one for us is security. Everything you crawl on the internet is public. And so then anyone, when they do a search, you can show them any of the results that you find. But in law firms, um, there's, there's very tight security. Some of these documents are extremely sensitive. If one company is acquiring another one, um, with that information, people can make a lot of money on insider trading or, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you can all imagine the, the chaos that would ensue if there was a security leak on some of this stuff. Um, so not showing people results they don't have access to is, is a big part of what we try and do in this search interface. And that becomes difficult when you, when you talk about trillions or more documents. So even a billion for us is, is, is a big, big problem. Um, also with type ahead, um, when you type a, a search into Google, you don't have to type every single character. It's trying to predict what you're going to search for. Um, but we want to do that too, but using terms from their index, because a lot of these things are customer names. They're not um, words you'd find in a dictionary. So we want to suggest those from the index, but in a secure way so that we don't show client names you're not supposed to know about and things like that. Also grouping in the document management system, Documents have a series of versions. We want to make every single version searchable, but then we don't want to show you version one as the first result, version two as the second. We want to combine them all into one. And again, that makes the search a bit slower and scaling becomes a lot harder. Um, on the left, you can see uh, a taxonomy uh, facets. So that's a tree, just tree, tree structure. Uh, this is the um, classification labels that we're applying to the documents. So that node that's expanded at the top called agreement. 
Um, we've then selected goods and services. So we're finding all the goods and services agreements in the index by selecting that node. Um, we also have numeric facets. If you wanted to look at the contract value, you can, there's little kind of bar charts that show different ranges and you can move sliders around and these all update automatically as you apply goods and services filter, then the contract values would reflect the, the ones that are in your, the scope of your search now. There's also date filters, string filters, and these sorts of things don't really exist on Google or Bing. Um, they're, they're quite enterprise search related. Um, in terms of getting the text out of documents, there's a huge number of file formats we have to support. Uh, PDFs and Word documents are fairly easy, but we go back to um, iManage is almost 30 years old. All of these old formats, people have documents still stored in those, and we still need to make sure we support those as well. I know the same with preview. When you find one of these results and you want to have a look at it in the web, web browser, we need to support preview on all of those as well. So there's lots of different problems. Um, we don't have page rank. Uh, we have to do everything using TFIDF, if anyone's familiar with that. It's um, quite an interesting read sometimes if you can't get to sleep. Uh, <laughs> and then maybe in the future we can start looking at learning to rank, uh, which uh, the AI team are already having a look at, actually. Uh, it's not just document search. Here's a, a screenshot from our older on-prem version because we've not yet built the expert search in the new one. Um, but on here, you can see there's different sliders on the left. You can say, I want to find people um, based on their bio or based on their build hours or other ways. Uh, other information we have about them, you can, depending on why you're trying to find someone, you can then choose which fields are most important for you in that search. Um, so how did we build this interface? Um, we took a lot of learnings from the on-prem version. The on-prem version started uh, in the Raven days about 10, 10 years ago. Uh, we, everything was installed on-prem. We wanted it to be simple installed, so we had as few components as possible, and they became quite big monolithic applications. Um, it was quite hard to onboard engineers into those. We had a lot of configurability because as a startup, we had to be flexible. We didn't want to have to rebuild projects every time a customer needed a slight tweak to their search, and so there were a lot of things that were configurable. That introduced problems down the line because consultants go crazy with that, and if there's a bug, the first thing you have to do is try and reverse engineer everything they've done to kind of figure, like, link it back to the code and why the code's not working properly. So in the cloud, um, with the rebuild, now we're not such a small startup, and the use cases are much better defined about what we're trying to build, and we're in complete control of all of the environment that these things are running in. We can have as many services as we want. So we went down a microservice-based approach, um, trying to pull all the different domains out of our application. Um, and we decided we wanted an event-driven architecture. And the easiest way for us to reliably um, put the events into the projections, we don't want to miss a security event that should have secured a document and keep it public in the index. We need to make sure we're completely in sync all the time. We felt event sourcing was the way forwards um, to help us solve those problems. And it's a little bit of an odd one because the document management system, which you think would suit event sourcing more, doesn't use it. Um, but they, they started building that way before we knew about Axon. So maybe one day. Um, but at the moment, it's the we're kind of a projection of the DMS. But as a projection, we've got event sourcing within that as well. Um, so this architecture hopefully looks fairly common to everyone that works on Axon. Um, we have an API kind of on the left, and one of our sources pushing content through the API. We turn the API messages into commands or queries, depending if they're mutating state or not. Um, at the top, we have the user interface uh, sending queries into Axon. We follow a BFF pattern, back end for front end at the moment. Um, and then on the right, we have our main projection. We have other ones as well. But the solar index is our big one, so we're taking events, building that projection, and then running queries against it. And then underneath, um, the document processing is, is kind of like a separate um, domain in, in our application. And we kind of treat that like a saga, but it's not really a saga. Um, so we'll receive an event about an email has been ingested. It might have attachments. We split those attachments out into separate files, and then we crack each file individually. Cracking is getting the text out of the files. So we'll end up with multiple text layers, potentially, for one document. 
those text layers get stored back into the DMS because everything there is encrypted with custom managed keys. And then um, the event we produce contains the ID to get that text layer back out of the DMS and we put that in, into Solar and then everything becomes searchable. In terms of our infrastructure, um, all of the cloud managed stack is in Azure. Um, for us specifically, we're running in AKS, so Kubernetes as a service in Azure. We have an SRE team that um, provide and look after that for us, as well as um, logging and metrics monitoring, um, Jaeger for tracing. We have Istio as a service mesh framework, uh, so we try and um, lock down the communication between all the different services using authorization policies. Um, and then when this gets into production, we don't have any access as engineering to go and restart pods or connect to solar or anything. It's all locked down. So we don't have any access to any production data. All we can do is look at the, the logs and the metrics that come out. Um, so it's quite, quite a different paradigm from when we were working on-prem where we had three monthly releases. And the engineers that have come from that, we didn't just throw event sourcing and Axon at them. We threw Kubernetes at them. We threw Istio at them. There was an awful lot for them to learn. Um, and hopefully that explains partly why it's taken us about three years to build this application so far, when Josh, in 20 minutes, knocked up. <laughs> well, we all saw what he knocked up. Um, so that is briefly the application, why we've built it, what we're ingesting into it, and, and how we've built it. Uh, so the multi-region bit. How are we doing for time? 20, 27 past. Um, most of our customers, whether it's the big corporates that have in-house legal departments or some of the big law firms, a lot of them operate in completely uh, independent regions. And they don't store all of their data back into one central place. They'll store their data in the various places where they're working and where their customers are. So all of this data is, is spread around the world um, in different regions that have different laws. Some of those laws can be quite strict if anyone operates in Germany or New Zealand, I think they're some of the strictest ones. Um, so we have to respect those. And if the documents are stored in those locations, that means our search indexes have to be in those locations too. But multi-region kind of has two, ac two aspects for us. We want users to be able to travel and access their data when they're remote. So multi-region access to the data. But then they also want to search all of that data in one go. So when they run one query, we need to be looking at indexes in different parts of the world. Um, at the same time, we want it to be as fast as possible, obviously, who doesn't? We looked at this from um, four main perspectives. Uh, we could either have one big globally connected application, or we could have individual regions and, and some kind of aggregation and communication layer above those. So we looked at it from an Axon perspective. Um, with Axon, it was a funny one, because all our data needs to be stored in one region, we need, and we want high availability. We have three Axon servers, at least, in every region. And then some data, like search configuration or maybe some user settings, could be shared more globally. So do we do that in one Axon context that's accessed remotely, or do we do it in an Axon context replicated around the world? Um, so before we tried to decide what was best for us, we thought we should do some testing on it. We created an Axon deployment with replicas in three very different geographies around the world, connected them together. Um, the RAF protocol required at least two events to be um, stored in different servers, and there was about 100 milliseconds latency at least between those. So the latency of all the operations increased, and because of that, we had to increase the thread count to allow more to be done in parallel. But increasing the thread count was the only configuration we did to achieve over 2,000 commands or events per second, which is way higher than we would have needed if we went down that route. Um, so yeah, that, was, that left both options on the table for us. We um, then looked at Solar as a search index. Um, with Solar, we have enough documents that we, we shard the index. And at the moment, we just let that sharding happen automatically. I think Solar hash is the document ID, and depending on the hash, each shard hosts a hash range. Um, so we could either have one global index, but to make sure that the indexes for a document are in the right region, we'd have to be quite controlled over uh, this shard is in one region, and so the document has to go in there. And then we have to start managing all the shard routing ourselves. Um, but the disadvantages of having 
regional indexes that you federate across, if anyone has read about TF-IDF, um, is the relevancy uh, is not comparable from one index to another. The score you give a document is based on the number of times that term occurs in the document divided by the number of times it occurs in the index as a whole. So if you put the same document into two different indexes, and one of those contains uh, very similar documents and the other one contains nothing like the document you put in, then when you search for that document, it's going to get a much higher score in one index than the other. So the same search, same document, you get different scores from different regions, which means you can't really compare them when you're trying to aggregate results from different indexes. So there's pros and cons to both of those. Um, with Azure, it's a very similar problem. We, we could have regional databases for Cosmos, say, um, but with Cosmos, you don't get the control over um, what, what shard your documents go into, or your data goes into. Uh, so for, for Azure, we have to have regional databases to store the data, because we don't get any control on, if we had a global database, where it actually ends up. And in terms of Istio as well, um, all of our services have authorization policies between them, and we want to keep that uh, security as tight as possible, and how do we do that if we have a global application? AKS doesn't span regions, so we have to have an AKS cluster in each region, independent. Um, but you can, with Istio, connect those together. So we did play around with that as well, similar to Axon testing. We put um, AKS in three different regions and connected them with Istio with their east to west gateways. And then we tried to deploy solar on top of it. Um, but the east to west gateways, if anyone knows Kubernetes, they only really work with Kubernetes load balance services, not headless services. And as a stateful set, the solar pods need to be quite targeted in which instances they're talking to, and they need a headless service for that. And we did manage to get it working by creating a load balance service for each pod. Um, but it was quite hacky and didn't feel like it was uh, going to be a robust solution for us going forward. So from all of these aspects, um, what we ended up deciding on is regional indexes with a federation layer between them. Um, all of these regions allow ingress from anyone, whether it's through the UI or the API, you, or your request can ingress to any region. We, from looking at the token, know who you are, uh, what customer you belong to, where that customer's data is, and by looking at the queries, we can figure out which regions we then need to route you to. Um, or if it's multiple regions, we'll send queries out to all of those and aggregate the responses. This federation layer um, is transparent to Axon. We have a new command and query gateway that kind of intercepts before it hits the Axon server. Um, and we figured this is probably the most robust solution for us because we have mutual authentication between the clusters. We've kept all of the um, communications local. So if a bad actor did ever to get, <coughs> did manage to ever get in, it's kind of localized to one cluster. Or if one region goes down or becomes inaccessible, the other regions aren't affected. Um, so for what, whatever might happen to any service in any region, we think this gives us the most resilience uh, in terms of keeping the rest of the application operational. Um, it also keeps it all very fast. If you, um, if you are in the UK and you're querying just UK data, we don't send any requests to any other regions. It's all very, very local. And the latency on those is, is in the tens of milliseconds. Um, we have to make some trade-offs that we were talking about relevancy just now. We are federating queries, and we do have that relevancy problem. Um, but we have some ideas about how to improve that a lot further going forwards. So that is Insight Plus, the application. Um, I think we've got a bit of time to talk about the Kubernetes operator. Uh, I assume most people are familiar with blue-green, um, but essentially blue-green is if you have uh, a projection, you want to build a new version of it in parallel, you give them different colors, you keep one live whilst you rebuild the other, and then you flip over when it's ready. Um, for us, the reasons we want to do this, um, kind of a solar focus again, but if we have index changes like a schema change or if solar has a major version upgrade, we want to do a blue-green on that projection. But indexing is slow. It can take weeks to build an index of millions of documents. Um, add to that, we have 4,000 customers. OK, we don't on Insight yet at the moment, but we're hoping one day to become the search index for the document management system. 
and if all of our on-prem customers move to the cloud, then theoretically in some number of years, we could have a very large customer base on this project as well. And those customers, as we just saw, if they're multi-region, they have different indexes in different locations. So there could be thousands of solar indexes that we need to do this blue-green on. Um, we don't have action access to production. We can't go and trigger one to start or bounce a solar node if there's problems. We need it all to be completely automatic. Um, and we want to do this with zero downtime. We've contracted to four nines uptime. Um, so it only gives us a few minutes a year to actually be down. And if it takes weeks to build an index, then we can't afford that. It's also fun. Uh, it's something that we've not done before. Um, I think it's written in the Go language. I'm looking at Rafa here, because is it in, it's in Java. OK, not Go. Uh, and yeah, we use a lot of open source software, like the framework, like Solar. But as yet, as a company, we've never actually written an open source project and given it back. And this isn't open source yet. <laughs> but we'd like any, anyone who's interested in it to let us know, because we're trying to open source it. And the more kind of clout we have with um, our legal department, the easier it should be to get that through. So how does it work? Um, we have a custom resource. I, I was going to try not to talk too much about Kubernetes in this little slide, because it's not specific to Kubernetes, the process. So we. The operator um, needs to understand what versions of your application exist. And then it will take each one through a series of stages, starting off with scheduled, so it knows it exists, but it hasn't done anything about it yet. Initializing is when it triggers that new version uh, to be uh, running at the time. And in, in that initializing phase is when you'd subscribe to the events and build your new projection. Uh, when it's ready, the operator flips you into serving mode. You'd be serving concurrently with the old version for a period of time. And then the old version then moves into a standby mode, where it scales down to zero if you can, but leaves the data there just in case there's any problems with the new projection and you need to bring that one back up. Once we've um, been in standby long enough, we then have a cleanup phase where it scales back up, deletes all the data, scales back down again, and then the operator then deletes it and it becomes obsolete. Um, here is the more Kubernetes-specific bit. We have a custom resource. And this is the YAML that uses the custom resource. Um, the key things are in the spec. We have the application, which should be the same value across all the different versions, so it knows um, which ones pair up. And then uh, also the version. So this isn't really blue, green, and colors. Um, we could do this for multiple versions at the same time. Uh, we wanted that ability because it takes so long to build an index that we have no guarantees that by the time we've, we need to make the next change, we've actually finished the blue-green we're currently on. Um, so we could actually skip versions in this case. If someone hadn't yet gone from one to two and we introduced three, we could go straight from one to three. Um, on the right is a Grafana chart of the states that two versions of this service have been in. Uh, the yellow line is the new one. So it's, and in this case, it didn't get uh, scheduled, it was ready to run straight away, so it went straight into initializing. It's just a bit of little, can you see that on the screen? The little bit just on the left at the bottom. Um, once it's processed all of the events, that could be a minute, a year, anything in between, it then marks itself as healthy. The operator sees that it's healthy, that triggers it to flip into the serving uh, mode, so that's a change to the label on the pods, and then that causes them to restart. So they come up in serving mode, and then we subscribe to the query handlers this time, rather than just the event handlers. We're now serving concurrently with the old one. Um, the old one will very quickly get moved into standby mode, uh, where, again, that's a label change, and it scales back down. Um, then there's a flat line whilst we're in standby mode, which is the grace period. The new version defines the grace period, because the new version knows how risky its changes are compared to the old version. So if it's minimal, you have a small period. If it's big changes, you have a bigger period. Once that hit period has expired, we then flip into cleanup mode. So now the old version comes back up again with no query handlers, deletes all the data, and then scales back down. And then it gets into obsolete mode and gets deleted. The key thing to note is that line, that serving line, always had a version live on serving all the way through. So there was never a point in time where there weren't queries being served. Um, the future of this, <clears throat> there's lots of things we want to do, open source it. Um, scheduling, at the moment, we don't have enough uh, c 
customers on this to actually need to kind of do one at a time or five at a time. But in the future, we couldn't do all 4,000 customers in parallel. We'd have to do, do them in batches or um, as one finishes, start the next one. Also, blue-greening within a version. Um, with Solar, if the customer starts having more and more documents, we need to increase the shards. Solar's not that good at auto-expanding and balancing the cluster like Elastic or Mongo are very good at doing. Um, so there might be reasons we want to do a blue-green, but within a version. So we could look at a process for that. And also, I'm sure there's things that we haven't thought of. Um, one I've just thought that we didn't put on here is uh, controlling when they're both serving, you might want to do a phased rollover. Um, so those are all things that we could look at adding to this. Um, so yeah, that brings me to the end. Uh, I think we've got a bit of time for, for Q&A. Thanks for listening. <laughs> I'm, um, it's my first presentation, if you don't mind, I might just take a quick picture with you all. So if anyone wants to wave whilst I take this, that'd be great, if my camera works. Thanks. Lovely, uh, thanks for that, Tom. So um, you can either do questions like this, but you can also do it through the app. And I'm actually going to do those first because those already came in. So the first question, Tom, um, how does the service mesh complement Axon messaging? Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's, we don't get to use the service mesh to its full extent for that because every service talks to Axon and only Axon and it shouldn't talk to anything else. Um, those are the authorization policies that we've set up. But then once it can talk to Axon, it can, um, we have scoped each application uh, in Axon's, I can't remember what the configuration is, you have users and then you have roles or permissions. So if an app is a projection, it can subscribe to events and queries, but it shouldn't handle commands. Um, but within that, we, can't, we don't say, I think we could probably write a plugin to do it, but we don't do it at the moment. Uh, we, we can't say it should only handle these types of events or these types of queries, which if we were doing stuff on HTTP, a service mesh like Istio would give you, because there'd be different endpoints and you can then control which endpoints are, are allowed to be called from one service to another. Um, so yeah, we, I guess we don't, being a, a gRPC connection and the way that Axon works, we don't really get the full use of what the service mesh could do. All right, thanks. TLS, oh yeah, so it does all our mutual TLS between the services as well. So we don't have to worry about certificate management, all of that's handled for us. That's, that's still practical, right? Yeah. It's still, uh, yeah. still valuable, all right. Uh, let's go to uh, to the second one. What was the most challenging part of federation? Um, probably the random latencies that you see and making sure that timeouts are set appropriately. Um, so the only time that we do go federation uh, is either when the user is remote to the data, or when the user is remote to the data they're querying, either because they're traveling or they're searching globally. Um, but as soon as you then do that that hop, you're at the mercy of the internet and could be fine one day and not fine the next day, or it could be slow and then do you time out, do you not time out, it's, it's where to draw that line, I think. All right, all right. Any other questions from anybody? And I'll walk up to you so that you get the microphone. You're being very nice. But uh, yeah, if that's it, I, uh, I'd like to ask for one more round of applause for Tom. Thanks. Ooh. Thank you. And so, yeah, uh, I hope, sorry, I just add, I was going to say, I hope you all found that interesting. Um, I like to put little random stats in everything sometimes. So I, I find, oh, it's gone off the screen. I find this one quite interesting that if you imagine how small an atom is, and how many there are in the width of your hair, and then how many there must be in you as a person, and all of us, and all of us in the world, the sea, the, like the whole of the planet, it's just an unimaginably big number, how many atoms there are. Yet if you take a standard pack of cards and you shuffle it, there are more ways of shuffling a pack of cards than there are atoms in the solar system. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks.